Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's our last après cours of the 2022 school year for the cross curricular subjects. So, uh, some frequent flyers with us this afternoon. It's nice to see everybody back. Um, this afternoon, we have a very special guest joining us from the Riverside School Board, uh, a wonderful colleague of mine who works in the office next door. Uh, Eva kutzman Blay is a certified sexologist uh, who works, uh, she's been working this year at, at the Riverside School Board in the youth sector, uh, supporting uh, elementary and high school teachers, students, and schools as a whole, uh, and has been incredibly busy, but she um, has graced uh, the presence of the adult ed world uh, with Riverside a couple of times this year, and it's been uh, a, an incredible learning experience for the teachers and consultants that have had the chance to work with her. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Eva, and uh, go ahead. I promised everybody entertainment, and I know you will. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I feel like there's expectations now. My goodness. <laughs> That was that was an introduction. So hi, everyone. I, I'm really, really excited to be here. Uh, it's not my first time, as Nicole mentioned, uh, giving presentations to the adult education sector. And I actually created this presentation. It feels it feels like ages ago, but it was just in August. It, it's been a long year. I think we can all relate. Um, I see the faces. Yeah. Um, but I created this presentation for the adult education sector, and we were we only had a short amount of time then. But the presentation has kind of grown uh, and has, you know, I've I've added to it throughout uh, the year. I've presented it to many different many different crowds, if you will, uh, and it's always one of my absolute favorite workshops to give. Um, the reason that we, you know, the reason that I put together this presentation specifically, uh, and I think the reason that as professional development, this topic is often brought up um, specifically, I hear, you know, sometimes we talk about sexual orientation, but more and more, I'm hearing that there's a need to talk about gender specifically and gender identity, which is really what we're going to be focusing on today. And the reason, which I'm sure you've all noticed, this is something that you know, I notice when I talk to any teacher in any, you know, I, I travel to a lot of different schools, meet a lot of different kind of grade levels. And what I've noticed is everyone says a similar thing. The topic of gender, gender identity, and specifically gender diversity is becoming much more important within our schools, right? Whether we're talking about just our relationships with our students, but also just classroom discussions given how politicized of a topic, even, you know, it's increasingly being politicized around the world, the topic of gender identity. So it's a topic that's coming up in our classrooms, no matter what. Uh, and a lot of teachers always tell me the same thing. I want to engage with this topic. I want to, you know, first of all, have good relationships with my gender diverse students. Um, but I also want to talk about this in class but sometimes I'm missing the vocabulary, right? Sometimes I don't really know how to engage with the conversation. Um, and often, like the most often, like the comment I hear the most often is, um, I don't wanna use the wrong, like I don't wanna use the wrong words. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't wanna say anything that might come across as the, the wrong thing to say. Um, and firstly, I do wanna say that everyone makes mistakes and that's absolutely okay. And this is a topic with, ever-changing vocabulary. However, um, what we wanted to do is give you guys a chance to really go over the basics, right? So we're gonna take it all the way back. Um, for some of you, that might mean that we're gonna go over mostly concepts, topics, definitions that you might have already heard of. Um, you might be super familiar with it. And if that's the case, awesome. Like that's, that makes me really happy to hear if that's the case. If this is not your first time engaging with these topics, that's great, you know, uh, take a breather, <laughs> take a chance to, you know, refresh your memory, relax after possibly a long day. It's been a long day for me too. Um, but uh, for some of you though, I, I do wanna make that clear that for some of you, this might be a different experience, right? This might be the first time that you're engaging with some of these concepts, maybe all of these concepts. It's when I've presented this in the past, we, I've had mixed reactions, right? Uh, and that is, Absolutely, absolutely okay. I think as long as people are here, 
willing to learn and open-minded. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a good time. It's a smaller group, so you know, feel free at any point to jump in, ask me questions. Um, we can get conversations. Some people, you know, I, I don't like to tell people how to engage. If you'd rather use the chat function, go right ahead. Um, but if you would like to scream at me at any moment, go ahead, right? <laughs> like we're a small group. I think I think we can have just a more casual conversation going. Uh, we have more than enough time to do so, though I'm sure that we're gonna find a way to fill it up. But I think now that my super lengthy disclaimer is out of the way, we can get started. So I think uh, this is time for us to get started. So first things first, and I always start with this uh, particular kind of explanation before anything, because we could like start deep diving into the concept of gender, gender identity right away. But I think it would do us a disservice if we do not take the time to differentiate it from other concepts that it is often um, conflated with. It doesn't take a lot of effort to go into, you know, a news articles, comment section on Facebook to find someone's uncle really going on and on and on about how sex and gender and sexual identity, they're all the same thing. It's all the same thing. It's just biology, right? It doesn't take a lot of effort to find people really misunderstanding these terms and seeing them as the same thing. But if there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from this section, you know, spoiler alert, they are not. Uh, these are three very different concepts that sometimes are interlinked, but we view them as independent of each other and they must be seen as independent of each other. So I'm going to start by talking about sex. Uh, Nicole has heard me talk about this already, but um, we, one thing that I'm going to repeat like a million times during this presentation is that human beings love to categorize. Um, I, I, I remember even learning this, again, I started talking about my background already, but um, I also have a psych degree. And when uh, in my class, we talked often about how categorizing people, things, what we see in our environment is actually a function of our brains. It's how human beings kind of organize what is around us. And we love organizing people. We love categorizing people and sex, or as some people refer to it as biological sex, is one of the many ways that we categorize people. In this case, we're referring to a categorization based in physical attributes. Uh, over the years, there have been many different ways that we've categorized sex. Nowadays, in 2022, and I'm sure that this is going to change within our lifetime as well, you know, science is always growing and building. But now we determine sex um, by the combination of XY chromosome, hormone production, specifically we're talking about estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And we also speak about internal and external genitalia. So these are all kind of the, the, uh, all the different elements that we use to determine someone's sex and what category they're gonna fall in. And now, like I said, there's been many different theories over the years of what, you know, what the categories actually are and who kind of fits in where. And nowadays we fall into three main categories referring to sex. Um, I think we are all familiar with two of those categories, the male and the female category. Uh, it's the ones that we hear most often. However, there's also, I really like to, to shout out the often forgotten intersex category, um, which is a category that you know, this is a, a very real community of people uh, that deserve recognition. And, you know, I find it sad that it took me until getting to university to even learn that this was an experience that exists out there. So I always like to give them a little bit of a spotlight. Um, so for those of you that don't know, when you are intersex, it's essentially when your, chrome, your um, chromosomes, hormone production, internal and or external genitalia does not neatly fit into the male or the female category. The medical system has a nasty little habit of, you know, claiming that these are medical anomalies, that these are just very rare, this shouldn't happen, but the community themselves, intersex people themselves, really want us to change the narrative to 
you know, this just being differences, our body looking and doing different things, and there's nothing wrong with being different, right? Um, also, I think there's this narrative that this is incredibly, incredibly rare, and it's simply not. Um, it's certainly a bit more rare, but it's not incredibly rare. Uh, we're talking that there are about as many natural redheads in the world as there are intersex people. So, I mean, we all know some redheads, <laughs> um, which means that all of us have come in contact and maybe in relationships ourselves, whether close or more distant with people um, that fall within the intersex spectrum. So it is important to acknowledge that, you know, this is a category of people that very much exists and is often, um, they're often, what's the word? I think, the, Invisible. I'm, I'm forgetting the word, but we often forget of their existence, and I do not like that. So now that we've kind of gone over just the concept of sex in itself, I want to highlight just a, a, a nuance that's important to remember, uh, because we are going to be talking about sex as we talk about building someone's identity as a gendered being, but what I want us to refer to um, is understanding the difference between sex that I just explained and sex assigned at birth. So all of us go through this and all of us, you know, if, if there's parents in the room, um, you have been through the process with another little being of your own. But when a baby is born, the doctor takes a good hard look at the baby's external genitalia and external genitalia only. And then we'll say, okay, you know, based on what I see, I'm going to make an assignment of the sex of the baby. So if the baby has a vagina, congratulations, you have a healthy baby girl, right? Your baby has been assigned female at birth. Um, if baby has a penis, then the baby will be assigned male at birth. Uh, I'm sure some of you are, are noticing that there's a big difference between what I just talked about in terms of the sex category and sex assigned at birth, right? It's a very, very reductive view of the concept of sex. Uh, all we're looking at is the external genitalia, and we're not even taking into consideration chromosomes, hormone production, uh, and the internal genitalia as well. Uh, so something to keep in mind, right, when we're often asked to sign documents where there's a little category that asks us for our sex, um, most of us don't really have a full global portrait of what our sex is and what, you know, what, where we actually find ourselves on these spectrums, right? Um, I certainly don't know. So what you are signing is usually just a, a little label that defines your external genitalia, which seems a little bit, a little bit, uh, you know, less savory when you put it that way. But it is important to remember the difference that, you know, often when people are referring to sex, they're mostly talking about sex assigned at birth, which is really what we have within our pants, right? Okay, so now that we've talked about sex, and again, I talk fast, but if there's any questions on this, please, please feel free and we can go back. But I do not see any comments, haven't heard anyone. So we can move on to our next concept, which is going to be more complicated. I'm putting it out there. But, you know, we've talked about sex. And one thing that I want to specify is that this is objective, right? This is what our body looks like and what our body can do. It's something that is objective, it's measurable. Um, it, I mean, it's something that we can all kind of see in a way. Um, and so we call it a biological construct, right? It's a categorization that is based in biology. There is gender, there's not so much that. Uh, gender is going to be a little bit more complicated. So if you need me to repeat certain things, re-explain certain things, let me know. Um, but just know that this is a concept that people have written entire books on, right? Like I was just trying to find a more simple definition and it is not easy to find one because in itself, uh, gender is very complicated. Uh, so I'm gonna try to, to be as simple as possible, but this is, you know, the people have entire PhDs in sociology on this concept because gender is in fact not, this is not something that is, objective, right? This is not something that is universal or objective. This is very much what we call a cultural construct or a social construct. And so gender, just like sex, is a form of categorization. I told you guys, people love, love categorizing. We love it. Um, and gender is the way that society essentially 
puts people into categories based off of a culturally and often historically specific understanding of what it means to be masculine, feminine, or even other, right? Some cultures have entirely different um, understandings of gender in itself altogether. Uh, and so basically a culture in a moment in time will kind of view society and think, okay, these are kind of the categories that I can come up with based off of like, that's it, what it means to be masculine, feminine, or maybe a third category. And this understanding will then be used to create the categories and then construct and reinforce the expectations of how individuals should behave, should act, and also who should fit within these categories. And that's why we say, like I said, that this is a cultural construct. Uh, it, it's socially constructed. This is not something that is objective or universal. And like, let me give you an example, right? Um, if we say, okay, the, the category of man, you know, the people who fall into the category of man, what it means to be a man, what men are supposed to by our culture and society, what they're supposed to look like, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to behave, how they're supposed to act. Um, all of that is very much dependent on the time period that you find yourself in, the environment you find yourself in, and the culture you find yourself in, right? Montreal in 2022, what it means to be a man is going to be different than what it means to be a man in, I don't know, Argentina in 2022, or what it means to be a man in Japan, like all across the world, the, what fits within these categories, this understanding of gender in itself, it looks different. And sometimes the categories themselves look different as well. Um, but if we take it you know, back into, into the past, uh, what it means to be a man in Montreal has changed over the years. What it means to be a man in 2022 is not, is not at all the same as what it means to be a man in 18, 2022, right? This is very much something that changes over time and is dependent on, like I said, the environment you find yourself in, the time period you find yourself in and the um, culture that you find yourself in. So that's important to remember that what is, what is within each category drastically changes and is very subjective and also the categories themselves, right? Our understanding of gender changes, has changed and will continue to change. I think we are going through a process of evolution as we speak which is what often kind of leaves a lot of people frazzled by um, these conversations that we're having at the moment, just because we're witnessing a lot, a lot of change. A lot of us were raised under an understanding that I wanna highlight that is known as the gender binary. A lot of us were, were taught this, you know, and, and not just explicitly taught this, but implicitly taught this, because this is a big part of how our society functions. And it's what we refer to as the gender binary. So the gender binary gives us pretty much what you're told is that you have two options, right? Uh, there are either men and there are either women and that is it. That, those are your only options. And on top of that, right? It's not just that you have two categories and only two categories. It's that these two categories are distinctly opposed uh, from each other, right? So what, it, what fits within the, the woman category is entirely distinct than to what fits into the man category. If you are a man, you cannot do anything, look in any way similar, bad. You must stay within your man category. You cannot get anywhere close to the woman category. And what is in the woman category is distinct and opposed to the man category, right? It's very strict, very rigid. Um, I'm not the biggest fan, as you can tell. It's a pretty, that's, it's a, a pretty, it's not the most inclusive way of viewing gender. However, this is a way that a lot of us have viewed gender for a long time. However, often, let's say you'll get this feeling um, that this is, you know, the only way to view gender, that this is based in biology, that this is just the truth. And we have to remember that while it is, a way of viewing gender, and I'm not the biggest fan, but for some people, this is how they view gender and, and you have every right to do so. It is important to remember that this is one of many understandings of gender, right? Uh, it's not universal. It's absolutely culturally construct. It's a cultural, it's a cultural construct. And it's one um, that is pretty much 
uh, based in uh, a more Eurocentric vision of the world. Um, and it's also not universal. We have to remember that there's so many cultures. There's like such a beautiful, rich history of cultures viewing gender entirely differently, having third, fourth categories. Um, and we don't even have to go very, very far to see cultures that view gender, gender I, completely differently than we do, right? Um, there are so many indigenous communities in, um, on, on the land that we inhabit, right? That view gender completely, completely different, have third genders, fourth genders. Their genders might be based, some of them in spirituality rather than physical characteristics. Uh, really, really interesting Google search right there for you in the future. It's one of my favorite topics, but it just shows that, you know, even close to home, there are so many different people that view gender differently. So it is important to remember that even if you, you know, you are particularly fond of the gender binary, right? If that's something that, if that is an understanding of gender that brings you comfort, who am I to say that you're wrong? It is entire. it's an, a subjective understanding, right? That's what I've been <laughs> repeating constantly. Um, however, it is important to remember that that's not the case for everyone. Uh, culture comes into effect, but also as we are going into a world that I think is even more inclusive, uh, we are seeing people, you know, find different understandings of gender that work a little bit more for them. And as people that work with people, right, especially people that work with um, students in an education context, we have a responsibility to make sure that everyone is included and, and feels safe within our classrooms. And I'm, I'm not just saying that because, you know, I think it's a moral responsibility. It's also a legal one. We do have to, we do have to remember that uh, since 2016, uh, gender identity and then not experiencing discrimination based on gender identity is 100% in our charter of human rights. Uh, I wish this were the case everywhere. Uh, there are some of our neighbors in the South doing things that I very much disagree with. Um, however, in Canada, this is, you know, it's, this is not just a moral responsibility that I think we have, it's a legal one as well. So I do like to highlight that. Um, sometimes I highlight it a bit more aggressively based on the crowd, but I think today is fine. Um, but it's just something I do want to highlight that you are absolutely free to, you know, connect with whatever model of gender that you would like. But, you know, we have to remember that uh, our students deserve respect and understanding no matter where they're coming from right so i think that's that was a big that was a big speech uh this is certainly that's it a pretty it's a pretty intense complicated concept uh it is like i said i've taken entire sociology classes that are called you know sociology of gender uh so if there's any questions again feel free i'm not seeing anything but if they come up you know, it's a lot of information, take the time to digest, but if they come up, we can always come back to that uh, in a second. So lastly, I did also want to highlight sexual identity. I don't see as many people anymore kind of talking about sexual identity and gender as being the same thing. I think we're kind of moving away from that, which is great, but I still want to highlight that it is a part of someone's identity that, you know, deserves uh, its own workshop, I should say. But uh, sexual identity, re it refers to the way that we, labels are, we label ourselves in order to acknowledge and reflect our core sense of sexual orientation. That's a word that we use more often, I would say. I just like sexual identity because, you know, it's, our, our sexual orientation is a lot, a big part of our identity. So I think it should be labeled as such, but it means the same thing. Uh, so some scholars will use orientation re to refer to the deep internal sense of who we are oriented to or who we are attracted to in terms of our emotional, romantic, and sexual attractions. That's kind of a, um, a newer way of viewing sexual identity is not just talking about sexual attraction, but also talking about the emotional and romantic attraction and seeing those as um, kind of more distinct spectrums because people can absolutely vary. Um, on who they are emotionally romantically attracted to and who they are sexually attracted to. So it's something to be aware of, uh, but there are so many different names for sexual identities. Uh, and that I, you know, I think we can, we can think of the more, the kind of larger group ones 
we have lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual. As I was writing this list, I forgot that heterosexual people existed too. Um, so heterosexual people, we must not be forgotten. Uh, queer, asexual, et cetera, right? I could spend a long time going through the definitions. Uh, we, it's not, that's not today's workshop, but it will be included. Um, my, my intern this year put together a beautiful document that also includes a bunch of definitions and uh, really just great ways to understand sexual identity and that will be provided for you guys at some point throughout the presentation. Um, but yeah, that's not what we're going to be focusing on today. All right, so now that we have differentiated those kind of three large concepts, uh, so we're going to move on specifically to focusing on the different terms related to gender specifically. And, and I say this um, because we, we talked about gender with like, I call it gender with like the big G, if you will, uh, gender as a construct in society. However, that kind of, um, you know, it's interesting to understand, but what really affects us is how we take all that information and internalize it and how that helps us build our identity as individual people. That's what you guys will kind of come across more in general. And that's really what I wanted us to focus on. This is gonna be a lot of terminology, terminology that you might've heard about that you might be already super familiar with, but I'm gonna go through a lot of words and remember they are all, all included and will be provided to you. So there's no need to take notes right now. Um, then it might be a little overwhelming. It is at times, but like I said, people love to categorize. There's a lot of categories. All right, perfect. So firstly, remember that's it. I've been speaking, I keep saying gender and gender identity. And, and so to just uh, understand the distinction between those concepts, gender in itself is like, a, it's how society categorizes people. But gender identity, that's going to refer to the way that we as individual people take all of this information around us and how we label ourselves, right? How we internalize that information ourselves in order to acknowledge and reflect our core sense of gender. I'm going to repeat this 40 different times because I think that this is super important, guys. Um, it's important to remember that gender identity, that's it, some scholars call it the deep internal, highlight that in our brains, right? Internal sense of being a particular gender. Um, Gender identity is what's happening on our on the inside. It's how we feel on the inside. It does not have to do with what we look on the outside. It can at times, right? What we look and feel on the outside can at times, um, you know, be reflected in our identity. Absolutely. But when we specifically talk of gender identity, it is what is happening on the inside. How an individual feels about themselves, how they identify on the inside. <laughs> I'm going to keep repeating it. So it really, really sticks because in that way, gender identity may or may not correspond to our sex assigned at birth, right? Remember, sex assigned at birth is the cute, fun way of just saying our genitals, uh, our external genitalia specifically. So what our body looks like does not always um, correspond to our gender identity. And so now I'm going to roll out a bunch of different categories because, like I said, that's what that's what we do as people. So firstly, you have cisgender people or cis for short, right? Both are completely fine. Uh, cisgender, it's just, it's just longer, but both the same. Uh, and that refers to all the individuals whose physical body and their internal sense of gender correspond and have always corresponded to their sex assigned at birth. So let me give you an example, right? Uh, a beautiful baby is born, baby has a vagina, doctor says, congratulations, you have a healthy baby girl. So baby is assigned female at birth. And because of the way our society functions, uh, baby is raised as a girl, grows up, becomes a, a teenage girl, and then a woman, and everything is fine. Everything has always been fine. Everything corresponds. It feels nice. Everything's fine. No distress of any kind. Sometimes people don't even question it, don't even think about it. It's just, it just feels natural. That's what we're going to refer to cisgender people or cis. Um, sometimes there are people in the crowd that say like, isn't that normal? Uh, 
we try to avoid using words like that, right? Uh, just because I don't believe that when it comes to gender identity, there's nothing abnormal or normal in any case. Uh, that's why we specifically speak of cisgender people as opposed to transgender people or trans people. Uh, so transgender uh, and trans refers to all the individuals whose gender identity does not align with what is expected based on their sex assigned at birth. So let's take the same example I previously used, right? Baby is born, baby is healthy, wonderful. Doctor looks at the baby who has a vagina and says, congratulations, uh, you have a healthy baby girl and baby is assigned female at birth. But in this case, you know, baby is raised because again, of society is raised uh, as a girl, fits within that category, grows up. And at some point, you know, sometimes people think that there's a specific timeline to which this is supposed to happen. It's not, um, but there's something that feels off, right? There's something that feels strange. Uh, and that strangeness is either really strong and loud right from the beginning uh, as this person is creating their identity. Like I've met children that are quite young that instantly are like, mm, something feels weird. Um, other people, it's along their journey as they're developing as a human being. Sometimes it's people into all the way into their adulthood and late adulthood that they realize something, something's not right here. Uh, and it's, it's like a feeling of distress. It's a feeling something's just not comfortable. And at some point, you know, this person will realize that they are transgender or trans. That's it. There's no right or wrong narrative for this. It's very unique. It's very unique experience, but something just does not feel right with the gender identity, how they view themselves on the inside, who they know themselves to be and their body and what that body represents to society, right? Something feels off, something feels uncomfortable and it needs to change. That's when we are going to refer to people as transgender or trans. Now, just some, a few notes on the term trans. Uh, first of all, the correct designation is transgender as an adjective. Words have meaning, we all know this, right? Um, so it's important to use it as an adjective, not a noun. Uh, I think we can all understand that calling somebody a transgender is slightly dehumanizing. Um, also, I think you hear it more in French, I would say. In English, I don't hear it that often, but in French, we often, like I've heard people say quite often, uh, un transgenre, une transgenre, uh, not, not with any malicious intent, obviously. Uh, it's just, you know, words have meaning, right? So uh, it is slightly dehumanizing. Uh, same with, it's not a verb. Uh, nobody is transgendered. It's not something that happens to you. It's a part of your identity, right? So it is an adjective and uh, is recommended to be used as such. Also, really important note, especially for those of you, I know in the adult education sector, please correct me if I'm wrong, I do believe that um, you like often there are still minors within the program as well. Uh, and, and this even goes for people that are not minors, but it is important to remember that like trans people do not need to change their bodies or even intend to change their bodies in order to be trans, right? Remember what I said, gender identity, it's what's happening inside. It's what's happening. It's how somebody feels, right? Um, it doesn't matter what someone looks like on the outside. If they are, if they say that they are trans, they are trans, point blank period. And the reason that I highlight this so much, especially for people that come in contact with minors, come in contact with people who might not necessarily have access to all the services. Um, and even for those who do have access to the services, we have a tendency of assuming, oh, well, you're trans, you have, you know, you pretty much have to go transition through some type of chemical or medical, um, even surgical process. And that is just it's kind of a huge, it's a huge expectation to put onto people. The reason I highlight minors in general is that as we know, is not, is not accessible to minors. Like even the most minor things are not accessible to minors in general. Um, but even for people who are above the age of 18, um, who have, first of all, transitioning is expensive. Transitioning is medically is incredibly, incredibly expensive. Not to mention, it, it's also, you know, it can be um, very taxing on the body. Like I, I speak of this, not from my personal experience, but one of my best friends is undergoing medical transition and I would not wish that on someone who did not want that, right? 
Uh, it is a very physically, we don't talk about that enough in my opinion, just the hormones themselves are a very physically and emotionally taxing process. But beyond that, you know, the different surgeries, incredibly expensive, uh, not accessible either, even, even in Montreal, which is one of the more accessible places in the world, you still need two notes from psychiatrists. Go find a psychiatrist short notice to say that you are, you know, stable enough to transition. It, it's hard. It is very, very hard. It's inaccessible. You don't agree with it, but that's why we have to make it a point to not really conflate the two, right? Uh, somebody's gender identity is not what their body looks like. And, you know, even if they might have plans, it's not really for us to, to comment on. They are trans because they say they're trans. That's it, right? Point blank, period. So there are, again, <laughs> we love categories. So there are many, many different ways of, of there are different categories that fall within the transgender umbrella. So firstly, we have trans men. So these are men, people whose internal sense of self uh, is that of a man, right? But that were assigned female at birth. Trans women are women. So people whose internal sense of self is that of a woman, because they're a woman, um, that were assigned male at birth. And then we also have a third category that is also an umbrella term because again, love categories. Uh, so non-binary individuals are all the people whose gender identity falls outside of the gender binary's understanding of gender. Uh, that's a big sentence, but remember what I said about the gender binary, right? It is a system that gives us kind of two categories, man, woman, and they are opposed of each other. People who are non-binary are people whose understanding of gender, whether that is just because of how they feel or culturally, it's, it's a, you know, what they've been taught, it's a part of their culture, for whatever reason, their gender identity falls outside of the gender binary's understanding of gender. And as you can see, um, again, we love, all of these are umbrella terms, right? And under the non-binary umbrella, you see all kinds of different words, and I will not be getting into the explanation of all of these different words. We've included some of them in the resources, some of the more popular ones, if you will, but it is important to remember that when it comes to people who fall within the non-binary kind of community, the non-binary umbrella, there are about as many lived experiences as there are people, right? People really, you know, have um, imagined gender in a way that is entirely different from a lot, what a lot of us have been taught, uh, and that is completely fine, right? Uh, there are a lot of different, some people feel comfortable with having kind of subcategories and subcategories and, and very specific micro identities, as we call them. Other people just use the label non-binary, but um, I think what throws some people off, like in the conversations I've had with teachers, uh, I never have I met people that were not willing to to you know support and care for their students, uh, but often there's you know this feeling of well I don't know what to do I don't know what to say I don't know what vocabulary to say and I encourage everyone to to just ask right like I said everyone has different experiences and everyone has different preferences and so taking the time to ask your students uh, you know how they want to be called what pronouns they want to use. Um, what words should be said, right? What sometimes when you know someone a bit more closely, right? What adjectives would you like uh, for me to use? Just getting to know someone and what they want is the most without a doubt validating thing that you can do. And it doesn't have to be more complicated than that, right? No one is asking you to be an expert on every single person's deep internal sense of self, right? That's, that's a lot of that to ask of people. Um, usually what people want is just basic respect. That's, that's pretty much it. And it can usually come from one conversation. So that was a lot of words. And I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to end with one last concept that I think, I think is going to be a lot easier for us to understand rather than, you know, the, the categories on, you know, all the, the different variations of gender identity. I want us to end with one that I think a lot of us will know examples of for sure. And I find this to be usually really, really interesting. So if you guys at any point think of 
people, uh, you know, famous people that come to mind when I, I'm speaking of gender expression, shout them <laughs> or leave them in the chat. But I, I really think that every single one of us um, will be able to, to really understand and also find examples of this concept. So lastly, when we are building the um, kind of the identity around the what, what I like to call that's the the uh, and identity of, of of us as like gendered people, if you will. Um, the last kind of element is what we call gender expression, or at times people use the word gender presentation. I'm going to say gender expression because that's the word that I have been taught, and that refers to the many ways that we con we consciously and also unconsciously exhibit gender through our clothing, our voice, our hairstyles, our body language, and our behavior. I've been talking nonstop about how gender identity is deep, it's internal, it's our sense of self. Gender expression, it's what we see. It's what other people see when they look at you, right? It's how we are expressing ourselves with, you know, our presentation, what other people can see. And because, again, I kept repeating that gender identity is internal, gender expression is outward, uh, gender expression does not always correlate with one's gender identity. And that really doesn't just go for people that fall within kind of the trans categories, right? Um, every single one of us here, and I know for a fact, knows people whose gender expression doesn't fall within the expectation that society has of kind of the category that you've put yourself in, right? Like I can think of, on a personal note, I can think of my little sister. Um, I can think of a million different celebrities, but I can think of my little sister who has said time and time again that she is, she's a woman, very comfortable being a woman. We talked about this like not too long ago where she's reflected, but then was like, no, don't like men. I'm very much a woman. Um, and she, but she has dressed since she was very, very young in the men's section um, to the point of uh, as a child refusing to wear girls underwear what a strange concept to gender clothes I don't know but uh, she's always she's always shopped from the boys section from the men's section because that's that's just what she likes it's what she feels comfortable with doesn't want to wear skirts doesn't want to wear dresses um is just comfortable with that and she looks great I love her but that does not change you know her looking more traditionally masculine does not change the fact that she is a woman and has always been a woman, right? Uh, and this goes for, again, I'm sure so many of you have examples in your personal life, but also if we look at pop culture, there are so many different examples, right? Uh, I can think of people, you know, the, the more traditional examples, the, the pioneers, people like David Bowie or Prince, um, but more, you know, contemporary, I know that Harry Styles has been like a big, big discussion uh, because he wears skirts, um, but also people like Little Nas X, you know, these are all celebrities uh, that, you know, what they have in common is that they are all men. They're very clear, like, oh my God, they always get asked questions about their gender identity and have been for a long time. And these are, are men that are very comfortable being men. That's not something that they've really doubted ever, but have worn makeup, uh, wear stuff that we in this day and age traditionally associate to, to women, right? Makeup, different hairstyles, um, longer hair, if you will. That's kind of silly too. But, you know, heels, skirts, dresses. Um, these are things that, you know, these are things that um, honestly, they, they do quite commonly. And we see so many celebrities and so many just everyday people doing that. And I think it, it's, I think we can all kind of agree that there, there's no real correlation on how you feel on the inside and what you just like to wear and how you just like to look like. Uh, they can be correlated, don't get me wrong, like they absolutely can be correlated, but it's not an inherent thing. It's not, a, it's not something that comes naturally to everyone. Some people just don't want to wear pants and that's okay. So uh, that's it, I think. So these are all kind of the concepts that I have looked at. Uh, and I wanna to present to you this, this kind of this quick little graph that I am obsessed with. I really encourage you guys to, to go look it up, save the image yourself. 
Um, and also I always encourage people to take the time to really look at it for themselves, right? It's an exercise that I often do with my students and it's an, an exercise that I really encourage everyone to do. because so I think a lot of us don't take the time to really reflect on our identity as just a person um, that is experiencing gender and everything you know that is that comes with gender. Uh, but I also just love the fact that this illustration, I think, sums up everything I've been talking about in a lot of detail very simply, right? Uh, we have gender identity that is represented by the thought bubble near our cute little unicorn's head. We have gender expression that is represented by the dots around the unicorn, right? To what people see when they look at the unicorn. And then we have sex assigned at birth that is very clearly put right near the gender, the uh, unicorns nether regions, right? It's, it's general, that's what it is. Um, and also they included physical attraction and ro and emotional attraction because like that is an important part of our identity as we navigate through society. And I just, I really like this image because they show everything on spectrums, right? Which is uh, really, I think where we're going in terms of our understanding of these different concepts. And what I find incredibly interesting is when I think a lot of people that sit have, have grown up thinking like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I fit the, the mold, if you will. I, I follow the path that society has told me I should follow. But I've noticed that when people fill this out, very rarely do people fall within the exact same categories on every single section, right? I think we are a lot more diverse than we give ourselves credit for just in general. Um, we are a lot more complex. We have a lot more to offer on the spectrum than than we sometimes than the jo than the gender binary would like us to believe. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage you guys to take a look at this. Um, maybe this is a tool that you can use with your su students, but it's certainly a tool that I recommend. You know, taking the time to look at for ourselves. So we have that's all the vocabulary. I feel like I've been I've been throwing a lot of words at you. Um, but that is all the vocabulary that I wanted to go through today. Um, now that's, I think what we can do for the last, because there's 15 minutes, so there's about 10 minutes left, if I'm not mistaken. If there's any question that pops up, please let me know. That's what we're going to prioritize. But I also wanted to take the time to go over one, something that I, I uh, included in one of the documents that we sent you, because Often, and this is actually this was inspired by the conversations I had at the adult uh, at the adult sector uh, at the Riverside School Board way back in August. Feels like years, um, but often people would say like, "Okay, this you know very interesting information. Like, thank you, but how can I put this into practice within my classroom?" And I came up with a few tips. There's even more in the documents that we sent your way. Um, but I just want to go over like a few tips because often it's not as complicated as, as we think it is, right? Okay, no, still no question. Okay. Um, so the four kind of tips that I just wanted to share, and again, there's a lot of writing, but all of this is offered in the little infographs that we put together with even more tips. These are just the ones that I thought worked a little bit more for um, adult audiences just because some of, some of the tips that we put together in the other document were for um, high school and elementary school. So, you know, pick and choose what works for you. It's, it's different types of education. But I think just in general, these are kind of good guidelines to follow. And again, no, there's no need to, we're, nobody's asking for perfection, um, but these are certain things to keep in mind. So firstly, being inclusive and personal right? Uh, the best way, honestly, one of the, I think sometimes one of the, the more important ways um, that we can really work towards making a gender inclusive classroom is, is the words that we use and how we speak to each other. These small changes can genuinely make a world of a difference um, for the students that need those changes, right? For the other students, <laughs> they might not notice the difference, but for, for the students that are that fall within these more gender diverse categories, um, it's something that they pick up on and really appreciate. So avoiding just gendered language in general is really the easiest way to avoid misgendering our students and just the people that we work with. So instead of saying boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, saying something completely neutral, like 
hey folks, hey everyone, hello class, hello students, right? These are words that have no assumptions of gender and do not reinforce this idea that we have those two categories and that in your class you only have those two categories. Uh, I don't usually believe that people that say hello boys and girls or ladies and gentlemen are like staunch defenders of the gender binary. I don't usually believe that. I think it's just habits that we have. Just like the habit of saying a Mr., Ms., Miss. Uh, that was not a habit that I was personally raised with. So that was an easy one to let go of. Um, but honestly, just saying the names of our students instead of adding kind of the, what's that called? What is Mr., Mrs.? There's a name to, I forget what it's called. Anyway, you guys you know, know what I'm talking suffix? about. Suffix? I think so. I don't know. Hmm, English wasn't my strong suit. Uh, but <laughs> in any case, right, just, just naming our students directly, um, you know, I know that these are habits and, and sometimes it's, it's rules of etiquette that we've been taught. Um, I don't think that your younger students really will care. And I think for the ones that, um, the ones that are really paying attention uh, to kind of the inclusive language, this makes a huge, huge difference. And again, we are avoiding uh, misgendering students without meaning to, right? Secondly, this is really important. This is the one that I, I encourage the most, but please be prepared to make mistakes and obviously apologize. But I think we have this extreme fear. I see this in any, every workshop I give, but also so many of the ones I attend where people repeat that they're so scared of making mistakes. I understand. I really understand. Um, no one likes making mistakes, especially when it's at you know, the expense of someone's feelings and their mental health, obviously but we are going to misgender people. It happens. We are raised in a society. This is, not in, this is not your fault, right? This is not my fault. This is no one's individual fault, but we are raised in a society that still very much functions under the assumption. Again, we're working to get out of that, but still functions within the assumption that, you know, you know there's two categories and men look a certain way and women look a certain way and it just is what it is. We know now that that's not true. However, it's normal, you know, as a culture, we do have a habit of assuming people's gender, um, assuming people's pronouns based off of their appearance. So every single one of us here is going to misgender someone at some point, whether we like it or not, it's a part of life. Uh, it's a habit that is hard to break, something that we can work on, but it's gonna happen. So when you misgender someone, uh, correct yourself. If, you, if they tell you, awesome, you've learned something. If it's just a mistake that you were already, you know, that you already knew, you correct yourself, you apologize, you move on. I think sometimes people have a habit of, of freaking out and taking up a huge amount of space and just uh, trying to justify and justify and justify it. And it's like, you're just digging a hole, like, let it go, let it go, <laughs> right? Um, people make mistakes, you know, if you accidentally bump into someone, you don't have to like lose it and, and start explaining why you accidentally bumped into someone, these things happen, just move on, right? It's a lot more comfortable. However, um, it's okay, but it is important to challenge yourself to get it right the next time or to keep trying to get it right in the future. It's harder, especially I think with people that we know personally. Um, if you've had you know, a longstanding relationship with this student and they come out and they change their gender um, and their pronouns and even their name during the year, it's going to take some time to break the habit. Uh, it, it's absolutely going to take some time to break the habit. It is important to challenge yourself, right? Um, people who just keep going, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. If you're not making an effort at one point, it does become purposeful. It does become hurt, hurtful, but making mistakes and challenging yourself is a part of, it's just a part of life and it's okay. All right. Thirdly, being an ally outside of school. Uh, sorry, outside of the classroom, uh, is something that is hard, not easy, but certainly encouraged, right? That's the meaning of allyship. The meaning of caring for our gender diverse students is going to be sometimes speaking up when they have a hard time speaking themselves. Obviously, though, we want to do that for students that are kind of open about this. Uh, it does happen. I don't know as much in the adult education sector, but I do know like in elementary or high school, um, we often will have students that come out to their teachers 
before anyone else, right? We'll kind of try out, let's say, a new name or new pronouns just within the classroom, but don't feel safe using it in other areas. We really want to make to sure to just check in with the students, right? That's what it means to be personal. Um, check in with the student, check in with what they want. Um, but if this is a student that is out and open and everyone should be aware, maybe maybe not everyone is, though, right? Um, but it is possible in those moments, you know, to, to if you see a student or a faculty using the wrong pronouns, the wrong name, the wrong, like misgendering directly a student, um, it is, you know, I think an ally's responsibility to, to just step in, obviously with kindness and with, you know, a gentle approach, um, but to step in and to just say, hello, <laughs> you know, uh, you are misgendering this student, these are their pronouns, and let's move on, right? Um, that is one way that we can really make sure that our schools are much more safe for our gender diverse students. And lastly, keep the conversation going. Um, just the fact that you guys are here today to me shows that, you know, we want to keep the conversation going, but often what we see in classrooms, and again, I don't know if this applies as much in the adult education sector, but in elementary schools and high schools, very often, you know, we'll have these big moments where we talk about uh, like gender identity or sexual identity. And, and we'll have these big moments where we talk about this during, I don't know, like this week, for example, was the International Day against transphobia, homophobia, and biphobia. And a lot of schools use that as a moment to kind of uh, lead conversations and, and teach. And that's great. Um, but just like everything, when we try to create inclusive classrooms, keeping the conversation going throughout the year is going to be, uh, it's going to be essential for it to really stick. And another, you know, another approach to, when I say keep the conversation going, you don't have to have, it, you don't have to have the same talk over and over again, right? Especially if you're working with adults, but sometimes it can be as simple as, as introducing um, examples that of People, you know, when you're using scenarios in your classroom or examples as you teach, you know, using a variety of pronouns, a variety of name, a variety of people with sexual identities, using examples of trans people speaking to illustrate certain points. I think that that's a great way to keep the conversation, to keep the topics fresh, uh, that this is something that you care about. And it's not just something that we're going to talk like one, one and done in the classroom. So again, I'm not saying that we have to have like 40 different workshops, but keeping the topic alive looks very, very, you know, there's so many different ways of keeping the topic going. They see some stuff in the chat. So Nicole has said that Riverside, oh, it moved. Oh no. There's a question first from Abby. Okay. Um, about I'm having a hard time with the chat. In our attendance systems, uh, is there a way to change the student's name so that it reflects and this Not, was a big battle this year yeah. we, we won though um because we we have some students uh and they are from the adult ed sector uh the youth sector was not open uh so the youth sector is as of 16 years old so yeah. as of 16 you do not need so you need parental permission which you can right if parents agree and and a lot of parents agree, which has been really, really lovely. But unfortunately, that's it. If parents do not agree, you have to wait until you're 16. And then legally speaking, yes, you can change uh, your name in unofficial documents. And that includes the attendance list. Um, that includes the documents that the school will use. When we say official documents, we're talking about like, you know, driver's license or uh, like the, the government documents. But at the school board level, yes. And Nicole, I'm really happy to hear that that you know it's been utilized at the adult ed sector it's really like silliness because the student's name when their when their fiche number or their permanent code is created is created based on first last name and so right. the argument was well we can't change it in the system and we're like it you input this information with yeah. your fingers into the system <laughs> yeah. you absolutely you. do not need to call like the person identifies as male and the person now has like a has been identifying for years this is we're talking adult ed so mm -hmm. our vocational training students who come back to take courses who identify in their whole life 
as male and now you're going to try to categorize them as female and use the name that they haven't used in 15 years mm -hmm. so we were able to eventually get to with Eva's help and her presentations um to awesome. stress the fact that it's, it's not acceptable to marginalize somebody or to reduce somebody to to that uh to that one quality that we that we as a society believe that that person and it, is way, so. an example that I can give because this I, I I don't feel this was when I was still an intern so I was like evidently more annoying um because I was like you guys are not paying me so <laughs> I'm gonna say that <laughs> but um <laughs> one of my the students that I was seeing who was over the age of 16 um you know I would meet with them and we're talking, this is a student who is sec four. Uh, we're talking like honors list. We're talking a 97% average, like a stellar student who care, like one of the most wonderful people I've ever met with. And last year, because everything kind of turned to teams um, and they were constantly dead named, you know, they were constantly misgendered when they were looking at their documents by teams. Um, their grades started dropping and they told me point blank it's because I feel horrible when I go and I look at this and it doesn't make me want to work and I love school and I love to work and so like they were very impactful um, in kind of pushing that forward it, it comes off better when it's a you know a straight A student but uh, it's it can be simple things like that and if for our student, for our, you, you guys won't have to deal with these types of situations just because of the adult, um, because you're mostly dealing with it with people over the age of 16. Um, however, you know, for people that were under the age of 16, or for people that are not necessarily willing and ready to, to commit to uh, an identity, right, we are always evolving and growing and sometimes we make better decisions for ourselves later, totally a part of everyone's process, especially children. Um, you know, what a lot of teachers did is they would kind of, they would have like their own attendance sheets. Um, they would have their own documents and they would like make notes of it, or they would just treat it as um, the way that we treat nicknames, right? Like there's, there's so many students that I'm sure tell you like, yeah, but call me this name just because um, it's easier or this is what I'm used to, to hearing. It, could, it can be as simple as that, right? There, there doesn't have to be that much of a difference, but I think a classroom can be a really safe space to try new names, new identities. Um, but that's it. Officially, the rule, the rule of law is not, and I don't believe that this is just for Riverside. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is throughout Quebec. It's 16. So that was an interesting question. And I think, oh my God, we're out of time. Oh no. Okay, well, that was my presentation. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, I don't know, Nicole, if you wanted to help me out with the sign off, because this is when I just start saying things. Um. <laughs> I was muted. Um, just to thank everybody for uh, listening, for uh, coming to learn or reinforce what you already know. Um, your students are better off for it because you are now aware at, or more aware um, and can advocate and can be that safe person for your students. So uh, we'd like to thank you for coming. Um, you. I, once again, uh, documents uh, video will be posted to the après cours. So it'll be time time stamped. You can uh, share that with your colleagues if they missed the presentation today and they're curious and they want to dig further. Uh, Eva's documents too that uh, her and the intern have produced will be on the applicable site as well. So thank you everybody for coming. Thank you guys Time so get much. Get and enjoy hey, the Go outside. <laughs> you have, like, I don't have a balcony. Go do that for me, please. Think of <laughs> and that. please note that uh, on the applicable website, there is an Anglophone community section right now. It's just for the Anglophone community. So there's a whole bunch of different communities you can see. There you go. Oh my God, that was the big red button. It was right there. Oh that was goodness. big red button. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Perfect. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.